Mothership Armor Meat Company of Chicago. They have a new drink called the Vin Fizz, new grape soda. And this will pay you five bucks a mile if you put our logo over your airplane. You advertise for us. Uh, it's a train, follows him with his wife, his mom, the press, a mechanic goes with him, spare parts. Uh, and he sets out September 17th, 1911, here from Sheepshead Bay, Long Island, and makes his way. That's with Chicago. That's part of the stipulation by Hearst. And through Kansas City, down to Texas, and across into Pasadena. He makes 70 different hops. It's a little rickety aircraft, mind you. I think the Wright Brothers kind of airplane. A little bike plane, no fuselage, up there all by himself in this, close to the weather, uh, flying this craft. He crashes at least 15 times. In the hospital a few times, the airplane is demolished several times. By the time he gets to Pasadena, uh, the only parts still original to the one he left with in New York was an oil pan and a wing strut. That's, that's about it. The rest all new parts, new airplane basically he arrives with. The trouble is, it takes about 49 days to make the trip, and first said to do it in 30 days or no money. So he gets to uh, Pasadena, and all the accolades, yes, I did it, but sorry, no cash in it for you. Um, mm. First side, mm. you, didn't, you didn't follow the rules and didn't, didn't quite make it. Um, this is a picture of the, the rail car here, has been fizz all over it, five cents. Uh, different crashes he made. Uh, it was, uh, the airplane now is in the Smithsonian, like in space, you can go and see it there. Uh, this is a poster made uh, for the, the occasion. Uh, he makes it uh, a few weeks later, so across all the way to the beach, lands at Long Beach, which is skids into the ocean. So they did it, ocean to ocean. Uh, a few months later, he's flying at the same beach, and a bird strikes his airplane, and he plummets into the water and is killed. And so it's pretty short-lived fame for Mr. Rogers. Uh, as the first, first person to fly coast to coast, so not very pleasant at all. Lots of crashes, uh, quite quite unpleasant. Of course. Using airplanes for moving people was you know, part of some folks' minds in those early days. It was a you know, craft for stunts. A lot of it was like circus performing. Uh, but the government says, how about air mail? We can move mail with airplanes. Who do you think would be interested in air mail? What kind of business would really use? Think of banks. Think of float time, uh, documents, checks. You have to go coast to coast. If it takes by rail, uh, about 100 hours, you can do it in, say, 35 hours by airplane, you can make some more money. And so it's well worth it to put the, uh, the mail on board airplanes. The U.S. government, the post office, is a 2 1918, started between New York and uh, Washington, D.C. They soon realized that the longer distance to make it pretty competitive with the train. And so 1919 and 1920 continued to extend their way across the continent, to uh, Chicago and then to San Francisco. Uh, by the early 1920s. And it's, uh, it's kind of like an aerial pony express. You have pilots and planes keep changing off, just change with the bag of mail, the next airplane, and keep going. Uh, the government decides they want to shut it down. They said it's not making money for us. Uh, this is the new party administration comes in, and he says, let's just pull a plug on it. Um, it's not, not working. So you're flying just during the daytime. At night, you're on the ground. And the post office says, give us a chance. We're going to fly day and night. We're gonna have farmers out across the Dakotas uh, put up these bonfires at night. We'll have some people outside of like in Nevada helping out with some, some lights to light the airway so the pilots can see at night to get across the continent. And they do, a spectacular success in February 1922. And it's, uh, it saved the airmail, and they uh, continue on with their experiment. They begin to build more of a permanent airway. That's truly the, the great advantage of this. This is on uh, Sherman Hill, fair vintage to, to Wyoming, put across on I-84. Uh, this is on the top here above, uh, between uh, Laramie and Cheyenne. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad runs alongside of this. This is the highest airway beacon in the world, about 8,500 feet above sea level. Uh, pretty lonely existence. Here's a little shack where the beacon, beacon keeper lives, the guy who lives out there all the time. Here's his little shack out back, as nature calls. Uh, this is the and the generator inside this uh, hut here to light the beacon, electricity, and it rotates. Every night it turns it on and it rotates. And the uh, pilots would look for these across the, the ground. That's what they'd follow to get across uh, Wyoming. The, uh, the early 
25 miles, they placed my beacons and the pilot would see it and just continue following these lights. What if it gets foggy? You're grounded, you can't fly because you can't see the next beacon. Uh, radio takes care of that. Which is radio beacons, you can fly at night, bad weather, and, and it uh, doesn't, uh, you know, it can still do that. Uh, in Chicago, they put a big beacon up. Uh, but they, put it, they took it down uh, for World War II. It's just so bright, it's just a big signal light. Um, and people didn't really like having these flashing lights. And uh, radio beacons were uh, much more conducive. But you can see, the, the airway was a big contribution the government installs. And railroads aren't too happy once this all gets going. It's like 1924, 1925. And the railroads say, wait a second here. The government's competing against us for carrying the mail. This isn't right. We're private industry. It's how we make our money. Privatize it. Privatize the airmail. And Representative M. Fife County of Pennsylvania leads the charge in the House and says, let's have a bill here to privatize airmail. Turn it over to private industry. And he gets that put through. Who signs it? 1925. And ready to, to privatize. This original airmail route, New York to San Francisco, that's where the government operated. The post office says, we don't trust anybody with our choice trunk line, they call it. Uh, let's have some feeder routes. Let's give, give companies a chance to, to get started and uh, have feeder routes into this trunk line. Start with that first. That's what they do. Um, I heard of Charles Lindbergh. He was yeah. the very first airboat pilot flying between St. Louis and Chicago. Yeah. He inaugurates that route for become American Airlines, eventually Robertson Brothers uh, at the time. The, uh, one of the routes that nobody wanted to bid on seemed like was from Elko, Nevada to Pasco, Washington. I grew up near Boise, Idaho. Right? I know there's not much out there. 1925 to 26, there was really nothing out there. Still not uh, A guy named Barney out of California was betting on that. Nobody wanted this route. And he took it. He got the contract. And United Airlines traces their lineage back to him, back to that route uh, uh, going to, to uh, Pasco, Washington. Of course, it was a really good route. And at the Pasco Airport, there is a sign on a big display on that. That's very right. proud of them. They are very proud, very proud of that fact. Uh, of course, Pasco is a rail head. You catch the rail lines here to Seattle and to Portland uh, from Pasco. And so, I realized that was a really good link uh, to the Northwest from the trunk route. Uh, other famous routes here in Salt Lake City and Los Angeles, the Western Air Express would have uh, had that route. One of the few that they make a lot of money off that route, because Los Angeles had a lot of business and commerce and wanted to use uh, the, the route. So most of our big airlines back in the golden age dated back to these feeder routes. That's where they got their start. The government says, hey, this is working out pretty well. These companies are doing okay. Let's, let's have bids out for the, the trunk route now. Uh, we'll divide it in half, uh, Chicago to San Francisco and then Chicago to New York. They give the two different companies. They, uh, Company bids from Washington State. Uh, you heard of Boeing? Uh, a small aerospace company. Uh, Bill Boeing sees opportunity here. Says, aha, if I can build an aircraft that can make money carrying mail and passengers between Chicago and, and San Francisco, let's have an airline. And that's exactly what they do. This is the Boeing 40A. So the aircraft was created for this route. They, uh, had mail could uh, fit in the upper compartments, and two people could wedge right in here and it's enclosed cabbage. <laughs> Windows slide open and, and closed. Um, it's pretty cozy in there in uh, Boeing 40. One of these, there was a, a later version that carried four people. One's just, just been restored in uh, Spokane, Washington, and flies around to air shows now. And you can go in and actually look inside, and, and it's it's tight. It's really, really cozy. But they can make prop with this air cooled engine. Um, no radiator fluid, and Boeing's are making money carrying mail, not water over the Rockies. And this aircraft was the very first Boeing commercial aircraft, actually built to carry passengers. Uh, I made the acquaintance of a, of a gentleman in, in uh, California <coughs> who had a series of pictures of the inauguration of, of Boeing Air Transport. And his father, this gentleman I'm acquainted with, his father took these pictures, 1927, June 30th. This is a handover ceremony at Chrissy Field. It's wow. down here where uh, Golden Gate Bridge is just located today. Right. And uh, here's Bill Boeing, right here. Bill Boeing right here. 
and your Postmaster Powers uh, is here. Uh, this is the last government air mail flight uh, on it. Uh, Vance just flew in, and they're ready to hand over the service and little ceremony here. Uh, here's the moment of truth. Here's Boeing receiving the first sack of air mail. The picture is in the book. He actually is ready to grab the, the sack of mail and be in business carrying, carrying the mail. Uh, his wife, Boeing's wife, Bertha, Bertha Boeing, she christened the uh, Boeing 40. Let's see in San Francisco. Uh, big ceremony, local officials spoke. Uh, military, it was a military base, the military was, was there as well. There's here, so Bill Boeing over here, watching his wife. His wife is here, breaking the bottle, the bottle in her hand, uh, over the nose of the airplane. Uh, interestingly, she only christened two aircraft, as far as I can determine. This one, 1927, 1954, with Boeing 707 prototype, the Dash 80. Uh, she was there and, and christened that. And she had christened more aircraft for Boeing. Both very, very good moves to these two airplanes. Uh, and she was a good, uh, good luck for them, uh, definitely. The first person to fly on Boeing was a young reporter, a female reporter from Chicago, Jane Eads. And she uh, never flown before, her first flight ever in an airplane. She gets in at night in Chicago and takes these hops across uh, the country, uh, across Iowa, Nebraska. Um, she writes about it and publishes these in the newspaper. It's, it's thrilling, it's exciting, it's scary. Uh, lighting the night, you can't see anything, and suddenly we boom, hit the ground. And, and uh, of course, you can open it and close the windows if it gets too cold, too hot, but there's no other comforts at all. Uh, she's wearing a whole suit, and once they get up to the west, into Nevada, it gets really hot. It gets a sandstorm over Nevada, and the public climbs to 10,000 feet, still in the storm, and she actually changes clothes inside that cabin, uh, puts on uh, it's a lighter dress she puts on and makes it to California within two days, actually 24 hours, I'm sorry, 24 hours to make it uh, to the Bay Area. And she's held as a great hero and started a wonderful service. So she's the very first passenger on a Boeing commercial airplane. This is the start. Um, you can see it here or not, this is a sawhorse. She's stepping on that onto the wing to get up into the airplane. <laughs> we had some stairs they built later on to get people up into the aircraft. <laughs> Your souvenir photograph. This is the pilot shaking hands with her. He signs it, writes a note, best wishes, and signs it for her. Uh, a big deal to have have uh, this young woman flying on on, on Boeing. If you're to fly during this era, to the open cockpit airplanes, how do the pilot tell you what's going on? It's so loud you can't hear anything. Uh, they pass notes, and this is actually an original note we have in our archives at the university, and this was probably a mid-1920s, I guess I'm here, and it says you're halfway to New York, one hour, 50 minutes, Snowshoe Mountain just ahead, Belafonte is the second valley ahead, it's where we're going to land, we're at 4,000 feet above sea level, make 105 miles per hour. So there's your cockpit update, and hand that to the passenger, and they read it and say, okay, now I know where we are, and uh, what's, uh, what's going on. Here's Charles Lindbergh, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with Charles Lindbergh and what he, uh, what he did, especially famous here in St. Louis. Before Lindbergh, air travel was a real novelty. It seems very dangerous. Why do you even want to travel by air? After Lindbergh, it was, hey, one guy in a single one's airplane can fly from New York to Paris nonstop. Why can't we go across our state? I mean, it, you know, people kind of put this logic together and say, let's fly. And uh, the securities and, and stocks of aircraft companies Soar investments between 27, 28, 29 to the crash of 29. Uh, huge investments poured into, into aviation, of course, radio. The air travel became very popular after Lindbergh. He's through the watershed uh, of being uh, water air, air travel being popular or not popular. He has an idea. He says, What if we can fly across the U.S. in luxury, in comfort? It's appeal to those who have a lot of money. Uh, they don't trust airplanes at night. Let's have trains at night, Pullman cars, really elegant Pullman trains, and airplanes during the day. So we'll have a rail airplane combination. So here it is. This is Coast to Coast by TAT, called Transcontinental Air Transport uh, by plane and train. This is going to be really that dark. The uh, little advertisements here, and it shows that you could leave New York on the train. This is the Pennsylvania Railroad, and you travel all night to Port Columbus, Ohio. And for Columbus, you get an airplane. Well, these uh, 
four tri-motors, all metal, three engines, rugged, safest thing in the air uh, at that time. And then fly hops, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Kansas City, Wichita, to Waynoka, Oklahoma. You're gonna land there, and that's you get the Santa Fe Railroad, and a nice Harvey house, nice steak dinner, uh, and dinner, and then on, on the railroad to Clovis, New Mexico. The next morning, catch another one of these airplanes, and by the Albuquerque, Winslow, Kingman, to Los Angeles. Do it all in 40 hours, a two-day time period. You're in luxury, you're in comfort, and get all the way across the country. Uh, get some backers from Wall Street, and they're in business. This is July 1929, this service starts. They never make any money off of it. It's about $250 one way, about $4,000 today's dollars, uh, and just for the people there that want to apply. And then, too, if weather's bad, you're on trains most of the way. So they joke it's take a train up. You know, TAT stands for take a train because it, uh, <laughs> you're not hardly an airplane at all. It's, uh, the weather is just poor. But uh, many people would write about this and say, oh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful experience. This is the inside of the aircraft looking from back to the front. Uh, here's the cockpit door. Uh, cockpit, uh, there's a the pilot here in the front. Uh, we have your seats either side with 10 passengers in this airplane. Say, why wicker? Well, it's light and starch is dirty. Uh, and it became aluminum later, so the early versions. Electric lights. And there are these things hanging down, big leather straps with a leather ball at the end. Any idea what those are for? <laughs> Not to whack your neighbor if you get them on you. Hang on to it. <laughs> it's really bumpy in there. You want to grab on something. And that's something that you can hang on to as this plane bucks around. Uh, the floor is uh, a rubber matting, which is useful when everybody gets air sick and it gets really yucky in there and you have a garden hose and wash it out. Uh, that was purpose for no carpeting. Uh, it could get pretty bad. Windows do open and close. So if you get too warm, you can open a window. Uh, the uh, in front, there's a clock. You should have a altimeter in front. We'll know how high they are. I'm very curious about that. It's really loud in this airplane. About 112, 115 decibels. So you have to you can shout at each other or just pantomime. The, the Petra accounts is all pantomime. They would make motions like, you know, Look down there. Oh, it's a Grand Canyon. Oh, there. You can't talk. You can't actually converse at all. Uh, very different than today. Here's the uh, the wings bar. Cuts over here. So if you're very tall, you tuck your head uh, up and down down the aisle. This is a picture looking uh, for the back. Here is a passenger having a, a nice uh, cold glass, probably lemonade. That was typically served. And here is this, the courier. They called them. The Santa Fe River had young men who were tour guides, well, couriers, and so they kept with this with the TAT, and they're pretty like, not a uniform. It looks like a straight up a yacht uh, with the, the white cap and the suit. And, and they would serve the cold drinks, uh, cotton for ears, chewing gum, with a pop their ears, so the altitude goes up and down. Uh, overhead bins, well, it's for hats or coats. That's about it. Um, especially if it gets very jumpy, things will pop off from there. So it's, uh, you don't have carry-ons. Everything is stowed. Oh, by the way, you're looking about 30 pounds of luggage. All you're allowed, and so you travel light uh, on the ceremony. Well, fast forward a little bit. Uh, to those couriers, well, to United Airlines, 1930, Ellen, Ellen Church, uh, she pictures right here, uh, had the idea of how about having a young female on board the airplane? <laughs> it would help people relax. There's a young woman on there, so obviously it's safe. Um, be registered nurses, so in case of emergency, there's a nurse on board who can, can help out. Um, of course, you don't want to have, uh, have women that will be 125 pounds or less, five foot four or are shorter. Uh, it's going to be quite young and unmarried. If they wed, you're out. Uh, you're, you're fired. Uh, and so this is the original eight, first eight stewardesses who would be hired by United. And the executives were quite skeptical, but they loved it. Uh, passengers really liked that. And one of the things I've read often is before the stewardesses were, came along in 1930, would fly and there'd be like all lights would be turned up at night and people get scared. It's like, I don't, nobody back, nobody at the airline is back here with me in the, in the, in the cabin. There's, I'm all alone with strangers. It's dark. I don't know what's going on. There's no PA system to tell me what's happening. We're in a storm, there's lightning. What's, what's going on? And it was a real great psychological boost to have airline personnel, young female nurse back with the people. And that was, uh, 
It's a very good company thing for, for passengers. Of course, the elegance of, of the uniforms of, uh, of the stewardess and hostess of the TWA and flight attendants I'm calling them up today. One of these uh, passengers, I go up in detail in the book, is Martha Marcia Davenport. Uh, she was a socialite from New York. She wrote a biography of Mozart. I mean, she was quite accomplished. 1932, she went on an adventure. She said, well, I can take a train, which is kind of boring. I've been there, done that. I can take a car, go across the country, but airplane, that's adventure. And so she flies from New York to Los Angeles and then flies back. And the account I use is her return flight uh, eastbound. Uh, she and her husband uh, fly in a Ford Tri-Motor. They uh, leave Los Angeles, stop over in Las Vegas. It was a dusty little town, little railroad siding. That's all that was there. She's happy to get out of, of Las Vegas. Uh, and they fly, of course, from Utah heading to Fort Salt Lake. They wave at people on the ground. There'd be old miners below or uh, kind of pioneer people out there. They come out and wave at the airplane and fly low over, over them. They follow the railroad lines. The airplane just follows the railroad tracks and you know, takes them right where they want to go. Iron compass, they call it. They get to uh, Salt Lake and other folks join them and they fly across the country on that trunk line on the Boeing Air Transport. The, uh, it's still those light beacons, and they get over Wyoming, and it gets foggy. Flies, as they said, down the emergency landing field, and uh, says, sorry folks, we're not, we're not moving tonight. It's foggy, we're grounded. So there's a beacon keeper's house. This is two rooms, uh, and there's eight passengers, and a pilot and a pilot and a stewardess. So all these people, they love to play poker all night, uh, but a few of them recline on the floor, on the couch, at the kitchen table, kitchen fusees. And I wait till the morning, and then I'll get the airplane and leave again. And Marsha is taken by this. Now here they are in the middle of Wyoming, and it's scary. It's all sagebrush, and there's nobody else out there. This is thrilling. This is the real Wild West. Her, her brain goes crazy about, oh, you know, this is the pioneers were here, and this was just you know, so wonderful to experience this. And a true adventure for uh, for people of, of the era. Called the passengers Neo Canterbury Pilgrims because they. <laughs> Like that, they'll travel together, swap the story, especially spend all night in this beacon keeper's house and uh, not much uh, to do. Well, airplane technology uh, goes forward. Boeing put in this called Boeing 80. It carried 18 passengers, still three engines, it's a biplane. Uh, reliable, pretty rugged, but still not much faster than anything else in the sky. And Boeing takes the next leap. Boeing 247, it's here, uh, based on the B 9 bomber, uh, has single wing, all metal skin. Twin engine, engine that are set in the, in the uh, wings. Uh, carries 10 passengers. It was much faster, about 150 miles per hour uh, on speed. And uh, it's a big coup for United. Uh, they're going to get the first 60 copies from Boeing. Well, everybody else wants them too, especially TWA. They want copies of this, but they can't get them. So Jack Fry is in his office in Kansas City, writes a letter to several. Yeah. Manufacturers and says, go get an airplane like this. <laughs> and Douglas of uh, California says, hmm, one of those military airplanes, but tell you what, we can't. We can actually do it better. <laughs> and they did. This is the DC 1. Uh, you go faster, it carries uh, 12 passengers in this DC 1. There's only one DC 1 ever built. This was it. And uh, it proved that it was a better airplane. And, and uh, Douglas says, that's like the fuselage, put two more seats in, so here's 14 people. The, uh, the wing spar is all below the um, floor level, so nothing to step over in the, in, the, in the cabin of the airplane. It's more comfortable, more sound deadening. Uh, revolutionary airplane. The uh, DC-2 then will become the workhorse. I got an email yesterday, there's only one flying DC-2 in existence, it's in Seattle. And right now it's flying across the country from the Oshkosh. And this is the 75th anniversary of the DC-3. 35 first flight, and we've got 40 DC 3s in Oshkosh uh, for the air show, and the one uh, TWA colors uh, was in Wickenburg uh, yesterday, Arizona refueling. It's a great picture, it's parked up uh, next to the uh, pumps for you know, 100 ll gas, and they're trying to put the fuel into this uh, DC 2. Everybody's like, wow, look at this thing. Uh, we fly coast to coast um, in about 16 hours with this uh, DC 2. People really, really like these. Something to notice here. Look at this. Great white. Oh, it's really fast these being passengers. Uh, the railroads, you wouldn't want to wear white. It's a steam era. If you 
people wore dark clothes because you had cinders, smoke, steam, it's just pretty grainy. And you notice the airline advertising, a lot of times people are dressed in light colors saying it's clean. It's a more pristine environment for air travel. Sometimes to, to notice if you're seeing old timetables or old advertising. One of the very famous pictures of DC-3 and Steamship Normandy here in New York Harbor. Uh, first of all, the Windberg line. Windberg was a technical advisor to, to uh, TWA. Uh, kept this on there until Windberg made his American first speeches and it's not seen as being so popular. It's called the Transcontinental Line. Uh, after that, <laughs> name off the airplanes. Uh, DC-3 changed, changed the whole picture. It carries 21 people. And theoretically, you can make money carrying just passengers on this airplane. So airmail now is going to be kind of secondary and try to become more just uh, passenger revenue. Uh, about over 10,000 these aircraft were built, most of them military, World War II. Uh, military uh, had the bullets as C 47s. Well, if you're flying during that era, there's still no PA systems. It's a piece of paper being handed back to update you on a flight. But now it's a form. So it'll be easier for them to fill in. This is August 8, 1939, en route from Glendale to Newark. It's uh, 3.44 p.m. Eastern Time. Drove over Bristol, Virginia. Uh, let's see, next uh, position over Roanoke, Virginia. Airspeed is 172 miles per hour, ground speed 188. Tail, tail wind, 50 degrees outside. 9,000 feet above sea level. Above ground, 5,000 feet. Front of Washington at 5.38 p.m. Flight conditions above our standards, 80 degrees on the ground. And there's Miss Hedman, who's still had been married to be a stewardess, so a form Miss, and a captain and a first officer's name. So they hand this back. You know, I, I, I own this piece of paper, and on the back it says, hand this back, what's here? Pass, please pass the slip to the passenger back of you. So you can hand it back to the back person, and they can do what they want to with that. It's just a piece of paper. And somebody fortunately saved this and kept it as a souvenir, and, and I got a hold of it. So, Pretty amazing to uh, think about that. It's not the uh, my board thing, it's a piece of paper, is your communication with the cockpit. More time. Uh, the government took about 183 aircraft from the airlines. So we'll use these for the war effort. By the way, keep your same schedules. Great, how are you going to do that? Uh, utilization. Aircraft in the air, much longer hours each day, and they do it. Uh, <coughs> have, they have four priorities. If you're a White House personnel, if you're a ferry pilot, uh, if you're, you know, if you have a priority, a priority uh, pass, you get on the airplane. You will get, you'll get to go. If you have no priority, if you're just a normal, you know, Joe citizen, no priority, you're on standby. You might get a seat, you might not. You, know, you pay your fare, but if there's somebody that has a priority, they get on ahead of you. And that's where the term standby comes from. And term bumpy, because maybe you get an airplane and suddenly, oh, here comes somebody with a priority three ticket. And sorry, sir, you got the flight. This guy has to be on. Uh, and so you're bumped off the flight. And those are priorities one or two. They're VIPs, very important persons. So that's where the VIP term. The terms we use uh, came from this, this era. This is a picture of one of the very first uh, TWA employees here on the ground. That would be female to wartime and put uh, men off to war and hire more and more women to fill these roles. Uh, pressurization, we take it for granted today. You get in a jet. Take off and you climb, climb, climb 30, 40,000 feet. It's comfortable. I uh, love this here. It's advertisement. Oops. Advertisement uh, from the uh, mm -hmm. 1950s. It shows the oxygen masks on. <laughs> Not like this. You didn't have pressurization. You have to have, have to have air uh, to breathe, which is very true. Uh, the Boeing 307, very first pressurized uh, cabin aircraft. TWA again had these, the first to have them just before World War II. And Pressurization, you can fly 20,000 feet and be comfortable. People were given certificates. I flew at 20,000 feet. You're proud to sign it. Uh, there's one in our, our, in our archives, the library, that would be given uh, to people. And it's a big on your wall. You're very proud of that fact. 1940, you fly at 20,000 feet. Uh, very, very rare. Uh, yeah, I apologize, hard to see. This is a group of passengers here. They're boarding the airplane. They're all their Sunday best. It's, everybody has hats. Suit coats, very finest uh, apparel. This is probably about 1945-46, I guess. In the pictures of GI, you know, Lord Corners, his helmet, uh, and beautiful aircraft. The Constellation that became the workhorse for TWA. Uh, it's pressurized, really 
pressurized, you could fly uh, over 300 miles per hour, very fast and efficient airplane. TJA would encourage more women to fly, and they had a program called the Mary Gordons, be women to be hired to go out and talk to women's groups and say, air travel's fun, this is how you do it, this is what you wear, this is why you pack, and encourage women to, to take to the air. And uh, this is a book that I have that uh, inside has a checklist, your suitcase, carry this. How many pairs of shoes, how many, you know, all these things, and, and it's just pretty straightforward what, uh, what you need. But it attracted many more women to, uh, to air travel during this time. I recognize some of these people. You know who this is over here?
look for fun and find a color with some pedestrian experience uh, once the jets are in place. One of my favorite charts of all time. This is a great, great chart that came out from the FAA. In 1940, this starts in 1972. And so billions of passenger miles. Passenger mile, one mile, one passenger. Standard of measure. We have rail. Here's rail. Here's bus. This is water. And here's air. So, during the war, look at this huge spike. First, there's rationing. There are 35 mile power speed limit on cars. Airplanes are all full of ferry pilots and people of war effort. And so, trains. Everybody's on a train. Huge spike in ridership. Uh, bus gets a big bump also. After the war, rail ridership drops way off and continues its slide, precipitous decline. Amtrak comes in here in 1970, 71. Uh, it was bad years for uh, the railroads trying to keep passenger service. Uh, bus lines stayed fairly constant, but look at air. Air didn't register on this, uh, it's already 43 really, uh, and this climb. But look right here, right here in the middle, 1957. Everybody's about equal. Railroads, airlines, and bus lines, pretty much equal on their, their uh, passenger miles. Trains are on the way home, declining, Airlines are on their way up. Um, air coach, of course, comes here in the 1950s. The jets come in 60, early 60s, and this climb, uh, and just say off the chart, literally. Uh, how about today? If you were to take this out to say 2009, some stats in 2009. Any guesses where these are? Bus, rail, and air. That's the same. The air would be way up. Air is way up. Uh, last year. It's about 549 yeah. billion, I think. So we're about, about five times higher this chart to, to chart that. Uh, bus, bus is a hard figure to nail down. Uh, best of my guess, it's about 40, about 40 billion, just inner city. I'm talking Greyhounds, just the buses go buy a ticket and go from city to city, not commuting or taking a tour. Uh, but uh, it's really uh, inner city travel. Uh, rail, it's a little below that, actually. The Amtrak's around six. Billion passenger miles. And so you can see the great discrepancy, of course, with it doesn't have cars on it, passenger cars, which is the trillions of passenger miles. But that's something to keep in mind as you think about the experience. 1958, more people crossed the Atlantic by air than by ship. So the great ocean liners are being eclipsed in the 1950s. Uh, 1960, 61, there are more people, uh, more of these miles by discounted tickets than first class tickets. Or coach passengers, economy class passengers. 1960, 61. Just, I was just kind of actually figured that out. Uh, just from the jet age, they already have more people to find a discount. Uh, this is from archives. It, uh, here's a little uh, rundown of the shrinking continent. 1929. That's the air rail combination. <coughs> this has an overnight stay in Kansas City. It's 36 hours. Two years later, it's day and night. You did uh, 24 hours. 36, 16 hours on DC-3, 46 after the war, I'm doing it Connie in 10 hours. Uh, first non-stop, the 1953, do it about eight hours. Jets come in 59, about five hours, coast to coast. Amazing thing here is 29 to 59, 30 years. It's a 30 year time span to go from don't trust the planet night to Boeing 707. It's just, that's why students say, what, 30 years? Yeah. Our last 30 years, our air technology is about the same. Really, no, no big leaps in technology. Technology is about the same. Uh, it's really amazing, this uh, former new era. Um, some of the things, like amenities. Did we made the first movie on board? Did we know the first in-flight movie was? 1961? Gone with the wind. <laughs> 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 By love possessed. By love possessed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have this big screen here that we watch. It's not, you know, it's a, the screen be up in the you know, part of the aircraft, a uh, projector, and quite a technological feat to get a projector and make that work uh, horizontally. And a uh, big screen here to, to watch the movie. Alcohol. Uh, domestic flights didn't have alcohol until the uh, early 50s, so there's already flights across the country. Western Airlines, you know, for Western Airlines, they had these champagne flights over California. And you 
you look on the Californian and you secure a van, you get you get a free cigar, you get the champagne, uh, pretty nice flight, steak dinner yeah. along with it, for women's orchids, perfume, and uh, champagne. Yeah, very, very, very popular. Here's one in the Spokesburg. And you say, what should be openly made of fly? These old TV ads from the era. Uh, of course, alcohol caused problems then too. And people getting drunk, making swings at uh, most of the stewardesses, uh, to, uh, doing bad things like trying to take a shoe off and bang a window to open a window that's too hot in there. It's like, it's a pressurized cabin, don't do that, sir. Uh, I had some, some issues. And lots of stories in the book about people behaving badly on, on airplanes. Uh, food service, don't get this anymore. This is a TV on flight, early 70s, uh, circular table. It's on Elton 11. Uh, first here's real, real silverware. Here's a wicker basket, some rolls. Here's the wine in the basket. Uh, pretty snazzy. People say, is that a real flight? Yes, that's, uh, that's uh, a real flight. I'm on the Elton 11, the white lights. And uh, maybe it's a little flight like this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, smoking. I recall the days of the blue haze down on the airplane. Uh, I was a, as a child and the teens, actually, when they did away with the smoking on airplanes, but uh, you get on board and there's that blue haze down the aircraft, and it's lighting up, and just assume, just that's the way it was. You get off the airplane and, whoa, it was really smell of smoke. Well, the cigarette smoking was allowed early on. And, uh, once the airplanes became all metal, they were allowed to smoke. It was, it was a uh, could ask fellow passengers, do you mind if I smoke? And if they said, no, go ahead. Okay, they can smoke. Hey, the airline supplies with cartons of cigarettes. You might have seen old uh, advertisements of cartons of cigarettes the airlines would hand out on the airplanes. So here, you know, enjoy your flight. And uh, usually uh, cigars not allowed or pipes, but cigarettes were, were fine. This is aircraft full of poor travelers. Don't throw your cigarette out the window. <laughs> Start a forest fire over the west. Yes? We also used to give away little mini gift packs. Uh, 
metal detector, and of course, anybody could walk through, passenger, non-passenger. Um, all kinds of warnings everywhere. If you hide an airplane, it's dire consequences. And there's today. Uh, this is your Lambert, the uh, terminal. The long lines of people, all the TSA uh, folks uh, there to, to scrutinize you. I'm writing a new book about uh, air travel and the uh, problems. I call the airport a landscape of suspicion because it's no longer a local airport. It's a wonderful place to be. You know, go eat, hang out. It's who are you? What are you doing here? Um, Where are you going? Where's that camera? I mean, it's, it's everybody's just under suspicion. The moment you're on the premises, and uh, airports work really hard to overcome that, and if they can, for me at all. Of course, you know, take your shoes off, take your belts off. Um, you've been flown here recently. You've flown the last few years since 9/11, um, and uh, the hassles. Of, I have three kids, three, three pretty small children, and I uh, flew across the country in 2007 with them. I said, never again to open it up. It was just too much. <laughs> not good enough with this anymore. And security, I mean, the airline, the airline was flying. Yeah, it was, I was great. Uh, but the security uh, is a big, a big deal. We'll talk about that later on, if you wish. Well, deregulation. Today we're debating this. Deregulation in 78 was a good thing. Was this something that uh, should continue on? President like Carter signed it in 1978, increased competition. Before this, it was the government economically regulated the airlines. You could say where they flew, how often they flew, what prices they charged. Uh, the competition was on service. What are the amenities? What extras could you throw in and keep your passengers happy? Uh, it's all changed. 78, it's this now 40 years of economic regulation. What happened? Well, new entrance industry. He yeah, has really dozens of new airlines pop up. Uh, People's Express, a host of airlines that uh, would, would uh, emerge, and many would last just a short period of time. They would start up, get service, and then and then uh, and go away. Uh, to defend themselves, the uh, established airlines of legacy carriers had public spoke around. This is a map of TWA, St. Louis, as their hub. This is uh, early 1990, I think, was this map uh, that they got. There's a better one in the book. And it's a way to protect your own turf. You can get better utilization of aircraft, you can serve routes uh, more effectively with the uh, common spoke, and it's uh, it worked for the larger, larger airlines. Uh, ticket prices continue to fall and drop about a third by 1992, and just heard that the last 10 years, the average ticket price has fallen by about 20% in the US. Uh, so ticket prices were the big winner. Lowering prices, and what's that do? Well, everybody flies. Everybody. And go back to this early deregulated period, and the, the uh, hostess is sort of say, these people don't know how to fly. All these folks come on board, they don't know how to, you know, distribute you know, a flight the call button. They don't know kind of protocol of what's polite, what's not polite on the airplane. Uh, and and yeah. everybody's had a more tension on the aircraft uh, in, in that, in that uh, area. Of course, legacy airlines, many would disappear. Eastern, Brana. And I am, Pan Am, TWA, Mandy's that would, uh, would be there forever. And uh, it's really amazing yeah. how quickly they would to disappear. I have a colleague of mine who is a captain of TWA. What's and he name? says, I had offered to fly for Southwest. Like, what? That upstart Texas interest airline? No way. What well, airline of the future? And I'll say TWA. Now look at it. <laughs> Southwest is uh, the one. Uh, some current trends as we uh, wrap this up here. Low-cost carriers, think of uh, Southwest, think of JetBlue, uh, airlines like that. Uh, Low-cost carriers, they want about 30% of the market now that they control. Uh, 10 years ago, about 10% of the total market. In fact, in total domestic passengers, Southwest is the big carrier. That's amazing, people think, what, Southwest is it? Yes, they carry more people than any other airline domestically. Internet, internet's a uh, huge innovation. Travel agent, you can buy pass all together. You can like yourself. You can shop your own fares. And you can buy. You can book it right there online. Uh, check in online. Southwest encourages that. And now, about 87% of all people check in online or at a kiosk. You never see a, an agent. <laughs> Do it themselves. And the first person I see is actually the gate agent taking the boarding pass. Uh, first airline personnel. So, internet has truly changed the way we uh, do air travel.
fees. One might let you know lots of fees on flights. I can't keep up with all the rates, but uh, there's a little brief list on the left side there. Uh, baggage fees, first bag, second bag, additional, overweight, oversized, we charge you for everything. Uh, ticket change, booking, on company miners, $50, $100, depends on the airline. Uh, pets, uh, you can take your pet to the aircraft cabin for a fee. Uh, seat selection, it's an airline, so if you want a window seat, if you want a bulkhead seat, then you have to the charge extra for, for those kind of seats. Uh, in flight food, in charge. Uh, I was thankful that the uh, US Airways experiment turned in two bucks for any kind of liquid beverage, water, Sprite, whatever, went away. It didn't work. People said, don't like that. At least give us you know, a little bit of soda and some press or something for, for free. Blankets and pillows, uh, leg room. I'm not charging actual leg room. If you have a little more leg room in certain seats, they'll charge you 20 bucks if you want to that seat. They'll add up. Last year, $7.8 billion U.S. Airlines earned from fees, ancillary fees. That's not chunk change, that's a big amount to, uh, to take in. From, uh, and wrap things up here with mode factor. You think planes are more crowded today than they were earlier? You're right, they are much more crowded. Uh, the uh, mode factor is counting the miles as a portion of available seat miles. It gives you an idea of how full flights are. 1950s, about 62 percent average. 50s, the 60s, about 54%. The lowest in 71, 48 percent. On average, airplanes in the U.S. were less than half full. 1971. That's the, the lowest it's ever gone. Mid 70s, mid 90s, bumped around between 55 and 64 percent. Uh, since 9/11, continued to increase uh, over 70 percent each year since 2002. Last year, 81 percent. 81 percent on average. So if your flight is canceled, good luck finding another, another flight that has some room on it. Uh, it's, it that really puts people in a bind. Do you, do you think that that 81% is reflective of less airplanes, less flights, so the planes are more full? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I've, I've seen that where okay. the planes are more full, passenger. but you don't have as many choices. Right. Airlines. So Trying to, yeah. trying to right size their fleet to yeah. match demand, so it's a capacity. Making money, that full. Yeah. Right, yeah. and so it's it's where's that happy medium? You know, how yeah. we continue to cut back, take away flights, and force everybody into you know, fewer planes. But where's that factor where okay, let's add more capacity, let's give people some breathing room. Wait, I saw a commercial where they they were showing like St. Louis to Chicago, there was like nine flights a day. I'm like. Yeah, I mean, four or five, I mean, that would accommodate everybody. So people have to just be yeah, sure. right, right. Yeah. And now they're going to go to regional jets, smaller airplanes, and still fewer flights. Um, look at this. This is from an advertisement for airlines during the World War II. How far is an hour? That's great. Right. This is the book. Good question. How far is an hour? Depends on if you're in this. Of course, buggy here or in his DC-3, <laughs> how far is an hour? And that's the point, air travel is speed. That's what you're buying, you're not buying flight experience, you're buying fast transportation. And that's bottom line, that's what we get today, <coughs> fast transportation. Here's a little tiny seat, sit down, be quiet, and behave yourself. And oh, by the way, here's a, here's a can of Coke. Uh, and just, just fast travel, it's not everyday really elevated at all. Yeah. rush hour in Chicago, an hour. That's the irony. The thing I'm working on right now, so the book is how ground time has, has grown. Oh, yeah. More time on the ground, and so your total time with air travel is just continue to increase. It isn't that fast. And of course, the hub and spoke it used to be a non stop five hours coast to coast. Now, oh, you probably get Atlanta, St. Louis, or Denver, or somewhere in the middle of the country, and to a hub, and so your total time. Extended. Um, it was a non stops, we're uh, the fastest. Pretty good.